Now this morning we are going to start off with some keynote speeches, but before we invite the speakers up on the stage, we also have a special video address. Now this video address is by Pan Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations. So ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look. Your Excellency Prime Minister Chong Hong Won of the Republic of Korea, Mr. Pierre Gardonnet, Chair of the World Energy Congress, and incoming Chair Ms. Marie Jose Nado, Mr. Chong Hwan Ik, Chair of the Congress Organizing Committee, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, I am pleased to send greetings to the 22nd World Energy Congress. I thank Prime Minister Chong Hong Won. Honorary Chair of the Organizing Committee and the Government of Korea for hosting. No other energy gathering brings together such a wide range of actors. Energy is the golden thread that connects economic growth, environmental health, social fairness, and opportunity. Clean, modern, and affordable energy services are essential for sustainable development and achieving the Millennium Development Goals. Wasteful energy use is warming the planet. Yet, at the same time, one person in five lacks access to electricity. We need your ideas and influence to address the world's unfair energy gap and the threat of climate change. My Sustainable Energy for All initiative promotes a clean energy transformation and low carbon growth. We have three ambitious but achievable objectives to be realized by 2030. First, to provide universal access to modern energy sources. Second, to double the worldwide rate of energy efficiency improvement. Third, to double the global share of renewable energy. Achieving these goals will unlock opportunity for billions of people and generate massive business opportunities. The Sustainable Energy for All initiative is combining the efforts of governments, civil society, and the private sector. This Congress is among the preeminent platforms for business action. You are here because you see the big picture. I count on you to support Sustainable Energy for All. I ask you to lead by example in securing tomorrow's energy today. I wish you a productive meeting. Let's give a big round of applause to the Secretary General. As I know, Mr. Yumkala will be delivering our uh, signs of appreciation to Secretary General Pan Ki moon. Now I would like to invite the speakers and the moderator up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Kande Yumkela, the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General and CEO, and Mr. Sanjit Bankaroy, founder of the Barefoot College in India. And the moderator for this morning session is our chair-elect of the World Energy Council, Ms. Marie Jose Nado. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome them with a big round of applause. Good morning. Good morning, colleagues and friends. Um, welcome to this uh, prominent plenary session, which uh, addresses the progress of the uh, Sustainable Energy for All initiative and promotes its continuous momentum. You all know that WEC has been a keen supporter and an active participant in the uh, initiative ever since it was launched by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. By 2030, the United Nations hopes that there will be universal access to modern energy services. But despite years of work to advance sustainable energy solutions, an energy gap continues to grow. WEC's scenarios report, composing energy futures to 2050, shows that global demand for primary energy is expected to increase between 27 and 61 percent, yet 1.2 billion people still do not have access to electricity, and 2.8 billion lack access to clean cooking facilities. How could policy decisions reached in the coming years make it possible for billions of people to experience sustainable energy systems decades into the future? 
How can we avoid the pitfalls of short-termism? How can private and public stakeholders work together to develop new governance for sustainable energy policies? To assist in these challenges, the World Energy Council, in collaboration with the global management firm Oliver, My Oliver Wyman, have prepared the World Energy Trilemma. The trilemma this year is entitled, Time to Get Real, the Case for Sustainable Energy Investment. Trilemma refers to the three key pillars of global energy, energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability. Increasingly, it is understood that we need to take a holistic approach to global energy policies. This piece of work seeks to provide examples and ways for policy makers and industry to achieve an en and sustainable energy system. We all recognize that more needs and must be done to improve the lives of these 1.2 billion without access to energy. To address this, these questions, I have the pleasure of introducing to you two high profile and knowledgeable speakers. They come to us with different approaches. We'll hear from Kande Yumkela. Kande is the chair of the UN Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. Until recently, he chaired the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. He is a passionate believer in the fundamental right of each person to have access to affordable energy supplies. And then we'll hear from Sanjit Bunker Roy. Bunker is the founder of Barefoot College in India. Barefoot College helps rural communities become self-sufficient. Barefoot solutions can broadly be categorized into solar energy, water, education, healthcare, rural handicrafts, people's action, communication, women's empowerment, and wasteland development. The college's mission is to provide basic services and solutions in rural communities with the objective of making them self-sufficient. He is an advocate of concrete solutions. Barefoot College is now represented in 64 countries and growing. I truly hope that our discussions will provide further inspiration for the UN Secretary General. Candy, can we hear you? Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Secretary General, again, we want to commend the World Energy Congress for this uh, great Congress that you've held this year. We want to thank you for inviting Sustainable Energy for All and for inviting the Secretary General. I apologize for him that he couldn't be here. He had made plans to be here, but as you know, he has many, many other things to do. So he sent myself and Christine uh, Figueres to represent him. Um, let me put your discussions in context. Today at the United Nations, we are trying to deal with two very big global challenges. One is that we are trying to define a new international development framework that will guide international development cooperation over the next 10, 20 years. So to replace the Millennium Development Goals, which will expire in 2015, so we have to define what we call a post-2015 development agenda and at the same time define sustainable development goals, which are goals that have been requested by all 193 countries when they met in Rio last year, that they want this new development agenda to have new sustainable development goals. It is a challenging exercise because it has to be by consensus. When we declared the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, there were eight goals we defined. It was easy to pass them. It was a compact, a social compact between the North rich countries and the South countries, the North wanting to help the South. And of course, they defined all these laudable Millennium Development Goals, but energy was absent. A few years after we started implementation, we realized that, look, the hospitals cannot run well without energy. 
The schools cannot run well. Women are poor and impoverished because a number of them spend 20 hours a week to collect firewood and water. Then they cook and poison themselves. We realized that, but we were not able to fix it. It was too late. So some of us said energy was the missing millennium development goal. We wish we had included it. You can't have clean water if you don't have uh, access to energy to pump that water, to filter that water, especially in a growing urbanized world. To define the new set of goals is more complicated because now it's not a deal between the rich trying to help the poor. It is about all of us trying to save the world. We want to spread prosperity, but we also know now we have to deal with the other big challenge, climate change. We want to spread prosperity, but we also know that we've been depleting ecosystems. So how do we define a new development framework that is helping to deal with poverty, but is saying to the rest of us that, hey guys, you've been consuming and producing in a way that is not ecologically friendly. How do you get a deal now that includes everybody, that says to rich people as well, hey, you're over-consuming, you're polluting, the poor people suffer based on your own action. How do you get this deal where we all agree to save the world, but also ensure that we have environmental sustainability? That's one challenge. Second, environment, climate change. We know that we can't fix it without an energy revolution, changing how we produce and use energy. Secretary General is trying to deal with these two. The reality is energy sits in the middle of both. You can't fix them. You can't solve those problems without dealing with how energy relates to sustainable development goals, how it also relates to climate. This is why he joined with the president of the World Bank to launch Sustainable Energy for All. Both of them are leading it. Typically, when you have these initiatives, the bosses don't stand in front. But both of them decided. President Kim of the World Bank joined this initiative one month after he took over the bank. That yes, sustainable energy was crucial to fight poverty. Fighting poverty means you must solve the energy access problem. Providing healthcare, you must solve the energy problem. And for me, one of the things I benefited here is to leave here with a trilemma. Because your message is similar. You're saying, look, energy security is important. Sustainability is important, but guess what? Energy equity. But it's not energy for the sake of energy, and that's what I like about the trilemma. It is what energy enables the prosperity, the health, the food security, the access to clean water. It is all of this that I see built now in your trilemma approach. So I leave here going back saying, wow, what we are trying to do at the global level to get this consensus, industry is sending the same message. That it's not energy for the sake of energy, just lighting. It is energy for prosperity and for social equity and also social progress. So I want to congratulate you for doing this. You bet I need copies to help you spread the word. I feel confident, as the Secretary General says, that we have partners in industry. But yet, your other scenarios point at another problem which you just highlighted. With all the good intentions, the efforts we're making today is not enough. Look at your numbers. You're saying, look, even by 2050, there can still be almost a billion people without. So whatever we're doing now is great, but we have to ramp up. Similar to the message from climate change. Whatever commitments we've made now to solve climate change is not enough. The earth is warming fast. So your trilemma and all the discussions here are consistent with what we want to do politically, globally. Our role with the World Bank and other players within Sustainable Energy for All is to help you have in place some of what you've been calling for in this conference. How do you get those long-term stable public policies in developing countries to give them access? In Sustainable Energy for All, we say it is not a charity initiative. Charity is not going to do this alone. We need the charity, but you know we need new business models. Bonker Roy will show you that even poor people are ready to pay if they have reliable energy. They're ready to pay for those solar panels and install, especially the women, because it's the women who suffer the most in developing countries. We know today we have four million premature deaths due to household air pollution. Most of it from use of biomass in the homes for cooking and heating. Some of it from kerosene as well. Four million premature deaths. 70 to 80% of those are women and children. Premature asthma, cancer, pneumonia. 
It is the number four killer in the world, number two killer for women in developing countries. Lack of energy because they inhale that smoke. In addition to the 20 hours a week women and girls spend collecting firewood and water. In fact, sometimes the kids are taken out of class, especially the girls. So if you care about health, if you care about women, we better make sure they have access to energy. But also clean cooking solutions. Somebody, one of your experts said to me yesterday, why are you talking only about energy? You're not saying electrification. I say, if I talk about electrification only, you're not looking, look at the cooking side. My aunt in the village today would like energy now, but I don't think she's sophisticated as to have that wonderful electric stove, the urban people want it, but she's still using firewood. I give you the case of Ghana, almost 70% electrification rate, but almost 80% of the population still use firewood for cooking. So I need LPG, liquefied petroleum gas and clean cook stoves in the homes as well. So deliberately with the World Bank and the UN, when we say energy, we wanted a broader look. We want to target that 2.8 billion that uses biomass. We want to bring clean cooking solutions, but even to do that, it's not charity, it's markets. LPG distribution, production, refinery will require markets. They require those long-term predictable policies that you've been calling for here. The last three comments I will make. One is we need both bottom-up and top-down solutions. Bunker Roy has set a model. We can bring solutions today. The technologies are there. Poor people are ready to do it. He has women who can install, and I have been with some of those in Sierra Leone due to his work. He'll talk about that. But we also need the top-down. What he's doing is necessary, significant, needs to be ramped up. But we need also top-down. You need commercially viable, large-scale projects that will bring energy to a level in a community that enhances their productivity. Yes, it is about industrialization. I listened carefully to this speech by the President of the Republic yesterday. This great country showed a model where indeed countries can industrialize within 30 years, faster than the Western world did it. But I tell you, energy was at the core of that revolution here. It is the same way for the next, this century and the next century, energy will always be at the core. We Africans demand more energy. We want more energy because we want to industrialize. Africa does not just want to be the place where you get raw materials. We have oil and gas coming from poor countries today, Chad, Niger, and other places that are the poorest of the poor. Nigeria, I say to Americans when I go to the United States, do you know you're one of the largest buyers of gas and oil from Nigeria? But do you think it is proper that 160 million people do not have up to 3,000 3, megawatts of energy? That's a recipe for disaster. Africa's population will be over 2 billion by 2050. Your scenarios. Is it acceptable that half of those people will not have access to energy? Is there any chance they can industrialize if they do not have energy? Can they build factories? Will you invest in a factory in a country where there is no energy? They're competitive. They're not competitive. Their costs go up 30% just to have a diesel generator. So what is my point? Economic prosperity in Africa, in other regions, requires energy to power that growth. It is the same in Asia. Whether it's in Bangladesh or Cambodia or Myanmar. They need energy to power that growth like the Koreans and others have done. The challenge is, as you have shown, 67% increase in demand for energy. If everybody does what the rest of you have enjoyed for 150 years, we will all suffer. This is why in Sustainable Energy for All, we don't only talk about access. We talk about doubling the annual rate of improvement of energy efficiency. We talk about also doubling the share of renewables. We need to change the energy matrix globally, not only in poor countries. Sustainable energy for all is not just about the poor. We are convinced that yes, if Germany can do 15% wind, others can do the same. We are convinced that if the Norwegians today, a major oil and gas producing country, are driving towards 100% electrification, from renewable energy because they have the natural resource, but it is a choice. It is a moral choice they have made to help the rest of the world. But yes, they make money as well, they sell more. It is win-win. What are these new win-win solutions and models that will make even rich people change their energy mix without changing their lifestyles? It is possible. 
I've seen it in Norway. I've seen what the Norwegians are doing. We've seen it in Denmark with energy efficiency. And we see yesterday, as the Swiss were showing also in the ministerial roundtable, that in Switzerland these things are moving. The Germans are doing the same. So yes, to keep prosperity growing, but to keep the thermostat down, rich folks also have to change how they produce and use energy. Sustainable energy for all, therefore, is inclusive. It is how we all collectively, as one global community, look at energy as a central part of development, as a central ingredient for social progress, but also as a way of ensuring that, in fact, we don't pollute ourselves as we go forward. Last comment. To do all of this, the message I heard from you is we need speed. That's why you say what we need to do today for an energy future. We need speed today, not tomorrow. We also need scale. The little things we're doing based on all the scientific information, yes, we're condemning ourselves to climate hell. We're condemning ourselves to climate hell. The frequency of disasters is too much. One disaster wipes out all the infrastructure investments the World Bank and others have done in a country. Just one. Takes them back 10 years. So if we continue business as usual, we'll be condemning everybody else. So speed and scale. Last one, we align politics, public policy, partnerships, and price. Politics will influence public policy. If the politics is wrong, if you don't accept energy as part of development, the policies will not be in place. So you need to align those two. The leadership must be there, like we saw from the president of Korea. The, the government is taking the lead to create the enabling conditions for the private sector to, to invest and do the scale and speed of investments we want to see. But the government cannot do it alone, and that was your other message, and it is true, we agree. But price matters. If we don't price properly, the signals will not be long-term. I have seen in Norway, even with a carbon tax, energy companies were profitable. Even with a carbon tax, they were able to finance R&D into ca carbon capture and storage. Price matters. And one of the things you see in your volatility is now the disruptions. Due to shale, it's about pricing. The subsidies matter. Can you do for alternative energy what you've done for other sectors? We're not saying remove what they have. We're just saying, can you level the playing field so the in incentives are aligned properly? So in other words, what have I done in, in 15 minutes? I've repeated everything you said, but just to show that we're singing the same song and we need to do it. Private sector, public sector. The challenge, join me in getting that together into real action at the policy level, but also at the United Nations. We need a goal for sustainable development, for sus sustainable energy in the next mix of sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Candy. Thank you. Bunker Roy, can we hear from you now, please? Thank you. Thank you. I like to think that I'm speaking on behalf of the bottom billion who have no access to electricity. And I'm going to share with you an example of how we think the poor thing about you. When you see, and I've been there in this village for over 40 years, living with people on less than one dollar a day, and they are restless, and they feel a bit let down, because what is happening at the top is not reaching those people at the bottom. Fifty years ago, when we started the Barefoot College, I came from a very, very elitist background, the best school and college in India. And then I went to this village, I went to a famine, changed my life, I saw hunger, starvation, death. And I went back home and I told my mother, that I'd like to live and work in a village. She went into a coma. She just didn't know what I was going to do in a village. No money, no prospect, no security. But then I said, I'd like to live in a village and see what we could do with the education that I had. So we went, I went to this village for the first time. Being just an ordinary unskilled laborer, digging wells, and I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge and skills 
that very poor people have. And I felt that we needed to start a college only for the poor. What the poor thought was important would be reflected in the college. And one thing that we found very, very strongly was there was a difference between literacy and education. You know, Mark Twain said, never let school interfere with your education. School is what you learn how to read and write. Education is what you get from your family, from your environment, from, from your community. So we started a college where only traditional knowledge and skills were actually reflected in the college, and we didn't give much importance to reading and writing. Today, we redefined professionalism. Who's a professional today? A professional is someone who has a combination of competence, confidence, and belief. A water diviner is a professional. A traditional midwife is a professional. A traditional bone setter is a professional. We found that these people were all over the world. And why aren't we bringing them into mainstream thinking? Why aren't we bringing these people just because they can't read and write? You mean to say they were not professionals? So we said that these are the people who need, who have found, identified the problems, identified the solution, and they need to be brought into mainstream because they had come up with very simple solutions. Alfin Toffler, we believe, he said, today the illiterate is not the person who can't read and write, but it's the people who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. So in the 40 years, that the Barefoot College has existed. What did we learn? Lessons learned. Lesson one, keep the solution simple. Demystify, decentralize, decertify solutions. And that is the only way you're going to bring communities together. You have to bring the communities together because they have a stake in this. You have to consult them. This is something that we don't do enough. Lesson two, in the rural areas today, the first lesson we learned was that men are untrainable. Men are restless, men are ambitious, men are compulsively mobile, and they all want a certificate. And the moment you give a man in a village anywhere in India or the world a certificate, he leaves the village within 24 hours looking for a job in a city. So what did we do? You know, what is the most powerful way of communicating today? Is it television? Is it telephone? No. It's tell a woman. That's the most powerful way we felt of communication, in the, in the, at least in the rural areas today. So what did we do? We train grandmothers. Illiterate, rural grandmothers who have never left their village in their life. In six months, through sign language, we trained these grandmothers to be solar engineers. And they went back and solar electrified their own village. Today, with that experience that we had in the Barefoot College, we went to Africa. Between 2004 and 2012, we went and studied the problems in Africa. And we found unacceptable conditions. This is the lighting that you see in Africa. You see this lighting all over Africa. Indeed, you go to the Pacific, you go to South America, you'll still see lighting like this. Unacceptable, and they have many, many names for these light, for these lamps. I don't, Candy. I, I think you come from the same village like that. They spend between five to ten dollars a month walking ten kilometers for lighting like this. So, what did the Barefoot College do? We went to communities at the ground got them together and found out how much they are spending on lighting. Between five to ten dollars on kerosene, wood, candles, torch batteries. We said, 
let us know, suppose we brought in solar light into your village, how much would you pay? Would you pay the same amount as you pay already for lighting, between 5 to $10? Yes. So the whole committee got together, the whole village comes together. They decide in writing that they pay between 5 to $10, and that money stays in the community. And the community collects the money, the money is there so they feel a bit more confident and a bit more secure. And then the community selects a grandmother. Ha ha, who who, everyone laughs and says, grandmother, take my grandmother, you know, I'm fed up with her. But eventually, they select a grandmother who has never been to school and college, who is illiterate. And it's and we have a great partnership with the government of India that should I select a grandmother from any part of the world, the government of India pays the airfare and six months training cost to come to the Barefoot College. Forty women every six months come to the Barefoot College from ten different least developed countries around the world. They all sit on that table they talk to each other, but they don't understand a word because they all speak Jola, Wolof, French, Spanish, all sitting on one table. For the first time, they've seen each other from different countries, all the same, and they get that feeling of solidarity and family. Today, while they're in the college, they learn other skills, how to make mosquito nets because they have problems with malaria, how to make sanitary pad units because they have problems of girls not going to school because they're menstruating. So all these skills, while they're becoming solar engineers, are, tra are taught to the women when they are there. They come as grandmothers and go back like tigers. They walk out of the plane like a star. They are just completely intimidating to everyone around because when they come, the, the men say, oh, you know, we've had many stories. Sometimes the men say, if you go, I'll take another wife. I can't last for six months. The women still have guts enough to go. They go, become engineers, and come back and solar electrify their own villages today. The men are totally awed, and they say, please come back. You have given us respect. You have given us credibility. You have given us so much, and the quality of life has improved. Sometimes, like in Burkina Faso, the, the man gives the same threat, and, they, and you say, if you go, I'm going to take another woman. She comes back, solar electrifies the whole village, and the man says, come back, and the woman says, no, no, I'm quite happy. I'm all right as it is. I'm fine. So you have these instances of women showing tremendous courage, guts, leadership. We had His Holiness the Dalai Lama coming to see the women. And he said something very profound. He said, now that you've shown the Barefoot College working in practice, let's see if the experts and the, and the donors and the professors can make it work in theory because what we are doing is everything wrong. So we have covered 32 countries, least developed countries in the continent of Africa. Over 290 grandmothers have been trained in Africa. They have actually solar electrified 45,000 houses. 450,000 have actually benefited. Over 1,000 houses have been solar electrified and over 500 women barefoot solar engineers. They are the only solar engineers of Africa. Only. Because the men have gone, they don't go back to the village, they're in the city or gone abroad. And they feel that they're the ambassadors. So where we are actually making a difference is not only in Africa, but also the world. Michelle Bachelet, great fan. She actually, we had a global agreement with the UN women to do some work in Africa as well as the Pacific. And she is, there she is with all the women from the Pacific. So, 64 countries 
in four years, we have covered and you know, actually reached 500 women all over the world, all grandmothers, all illiterate, all solar engineers, and all shown how the example can be set. So today, we have partners. You can't do without partners. We can't do it alone. So we have partnership with the UN Women, we have partnership with UNESCO, we have partnership with UNDP and the government of India. So we like to think that the barefoot model, which is demystified, decentralized, decertified, is something that the women and the people own. The ownership is important because it's simple. It's the ownership that will make it sustainable, not some expert coming from outside telling you what to do. Develop the capacity and competence of people from below to make it work and make them feel that they have access to the most sophisticated technologies and make it work. So, all this has cost us, without being embarrassing, maybe what it cost this conference to do this. I like to think that the barefoot model is a global model, is a simple model. And I would like to end with what St. Francis said very clearly. Start by doing what is necessary, then do what is possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes left, and um, I have one question, and I'll uh, make it easy. I'll keep it simple. I, it's the same question for both of you. What is your message to governments? I'll be traveling the world in the next three years. Our colleagues here in the assembly have access to their governments. What is your message to governments? What message can we convey so that we make the difference? Kande, you say we have to ramp up, but if I ask you to go a step further in concrete terms, what can we tell them? To developing country governments that have high incidence of energy poverty, I say to them, this is not charity. You must reform the sector. There must be a clear energy governance. That's when investors come in. This is not a gift. You got to show that those policies will also be there 20, 30 years. And that's what the Ghanaians did. 25 years of consistent rural electrification in spite of change of governments. So the, the public policy message to deregulate on bundle and show clear governance in the sector, crucial. To rich countries, to rich countries I say, especially in the context of Africa, look at Africa as a place, as your next frontier, as your next market. Look at Africa as a place where you do investments so that you create opportunities. Otherwise, you will have worse Lampedusa drownings than we saw last week. We are not even 1.4 billion yet. We're going to be 1.4 billion in 2030, 2035, 2 billion. If still 400 people are dying when we are few, if there are no economic opportunities, they had not. So what is my point? Poverty reduction must include a message of wealth creation, competitiveness, and prosperity for people. The trade relations then change from charity to one of business partnerships, jobs, and opportunity for all. So I give similar messages, but different nuances. Thank you. Bunker, you must have a message you would want me to convey to governments and all of us. Sadly, governments have lost touch with their communities. I think governments can learn a lot from communities. They always underestimate the capacity and competence of communities to solve their own problems. I think there are models all over the world where the community has shown, taken an taken, uh, initiative to show that they can solve their own solutions. Government must listen and learn. They must have a forum where they can listen and learn from indigenous solutions. I think the indigenization of solutions is a must. 
South-South cooperation is a must. There are solutions which we can learn from each other. It doesn't have to, and governments have to facilitate this. And I think the facilitation is so important. I've never ever underestimated the capacity of communities to identify the problem and solve it. Governments must facilitate this rather than bring something from outside. Thank you. I think both messages go very well together. First, uh, if I may, uh, if I may uh, interpret what you just said, uh, stop the denial, be in contact with your community, and put your act together. This is what we will convey to our um, host governments when we travel around the world and or go back to uh, our own countries. Thank you very much for your attention, but before we close, I would like to share with you a gift from Bunker. <laughs> and I told them that I would wear it on the stage. So Bunker, can you please describe what it is? Made by rural women. It's an employee and they sell it and uh, this is a waste. You're wearing actually agricultural waste. <laughs> Thank you very much.